service you be magnified as lord god and king forever there is no one like you jehovah there is no one like you jesus we declare that you reign supreme and sovereign over this worship and over this service you take your glory today and reign you take your praise today and reign you deserve the glory lord as we gather here we gather to honor our god on the sabbath we gather to honor our god we brag on our God for there is no one like you Jehovah there is no one like the ever living God hallelujah 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 you reign above all kings and all kingdoms you are the beginning you are the end oh God hallowed be your name hallowed be your name hallowed be your name to him who sits on the throne and unto the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and power and praise this day hallelujah 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 we glorify the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth we exalt his name declaring him king and lord forever this day we bless you Jesus we bless you we bless you we thank you your name your name be lifted up your name be exalted the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is lord today we exalt you and we bless bless you we exalt you and we glorify you we sanctify the very sanctuary we sanctify the very atmosphere with the blood of the lamb today we thank you we declare it holy unto our God we declare it holy unto our God and so today we bless our worship and we bless my God the entire team even your servant that will bring the word we thank you we will celebrate in our God we will even celebrate in the word of God God we thank you we will receive what the spirit of the Lord has to say today and so Lord I proclaim a freedom and a liberty of worship now and be glorified be the worship Lord as we enter into a time of prayer today and worship hallelujah hallelujah be glorified hallelujah give the Lord a praise somebody hallelujah and I want you to sing with all your heart. We have our team, most of our team was sick with COVID. And so you don't see them there. But we are still here to worship the living God. Okay. So come on. Let's just worship the Lord. Put your hand Hallelujah. together again as we praise our God. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Let us praise Jesus this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on. My Savior, Redeemer. Lifted me from the miry clay, Almighty, forever. I will never be the same, cause you came down from the everlasting to the world we live. The Father's only
worship Jesus this morning, our Lord, our Savior, our King, our Father in heaven. Oh, He is our Savior, our Jesus, our beloved Lord. Hallelujah. Come, let us worship. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Somebody say Jesus in the house. Amen. You can say louder than that. He's, you're standing because of his name today. Amen. His name is Jesus. It's a beautiful name. It resonates when you say that name. Every demonic force leaves the atmosphere. Would you just greet somebody as you take your seats. Amen. Praise God. We have such a great service. and such an anointing on this pulpit. Welcome. This is the day that the Lord has made. And we will rejoice. And be glad in it. Is there anyone visiting us for the first time this morning? By a show of hands, anyone visiting us for the first time? Amen. Praise God. Um, I'm just going to pray for some. Uh, for, um, we, we have our guys out in the South Coast, Prophet Gresham and his team. Um, and we have our team going out to Cameroon. And we've instructed the prophets. And I just realized we're live. We instructed them that um, they should fast and pray from Tuesday for this team. So today, would you just stand with me um, as we release a word over this team? Because the Bible says, in Prophet Zephaniah says, in Zephaniah 3 verse 8, He's going to restore to the people a pure language, that they may call on the name of the Lord to serve Him in one accord. Amen. It goes on to say, and they will leave. When our team gets to Cameroon, Pastor Amos has gone already to lay the way, to pave the way like John the Baptist to announce that we are coming. It says, after they leave, they'll leave a meek and humble people that will put their trust again in the name of the Lord. And the remnant of Cameroon shall do no more unrighteousness, nor shall their deceitful tongue be found in their mouth and no one, no other God will make Cameroon afraid again. 
Amen. So we just want to pray for this team. And I'll do the offering much later because we're live. Um, and we want to give God the glory for what He's doing in this house. Amen. Amen. It's a United in Christ team headed by Apostle Anil. Uh, for those that are watching uh, around the world, keep our team. Um, and this is evidence that the team will infiltrate Africa. And Africa will be known as a continent for Jesus. This is the start of it. It's been done before, but in 2022, COVID couldn't stop them. Under Apostle Anil and Pastor Sohana, uh, Prophet Amos, pa Apostle Harold, and Apostle Craig, the five of them are going with the fivefold ministries, uh, and the main meetings will be from the 5th to the 7th. As I've said before, Pastor Amos is gone. But we also want to keep these great men of God that may be watching today, we want to keep them in prayer. Our Reverend Dr. Priso, our Reverend Dr. Awa, and Guy by your Apostle, Guy by Young. Let us just pray. Father, we give you glory today. We give you honor and praise, for you are a great God. The footsteps of the righteous are ordered by God. And we declare today that you are ordering the footsteps of this great men. And we give you praise and honor, for you are a great God. And as the, 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 the congregants and as our divine connectors throughout the world connect with us, we say that we place upon these men fire we place upon their lips coals of fire that there will be signs wonders and miracles in everything that they do and touch in jesus name amen amen his goodness runneth over and blesses us all the days of our lives he's faithful he's able god is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or imagine this morning in your lives and through your lives this morning it's all about jesus amen, amen. thank you lord I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness. God. And all my life you have been faithful. Yes, you have, Jesus. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made, oh, I will sing of the goodness. Of God, I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived. In the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made Running out, it's running out to me. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. My life lays on, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running out, it's running out. 
mighty king we praise you and we glorify your name we exalt you as the king of kings and the lord of lords there is none other you are the creator of the heavens and earth you are the alpha and the omega oh we bless your holy name and we thank you for your presence oh lord be exalted in our midst my father receive our praise our worship as a sweet smelling aroma as a sweet smelling incense unto you my father for you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. You are Jehovah Rapha, our healer. You are Jehovah Nisi, our banner. You are Jehovah Shalom, our peace. You are Jehovah Rohi, our shepherd, Lord. And we bless your holy name. We bless your holy name. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for being our father and for loving us with such an unconditional heart. We thank you for the cross of Calvary, O oh Lord. O oh Lord, that your only begotten Son was crucified on the cross of Calvary so that we could be made worthy and righteous through the precious blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I thank you for the blood of Jesus, O oh Lord. The blood of Jesus that washes us whiter than snow, my Father. I thank you, my Father, for there's power in the blood of Jesus. There's healing in the blood of Jesus. There's victory in the blood of Jesus. There's deliverance in the blood of Jesus. There's protection in the blood of Jesus. I thank you, Lord. For the precious blood has never lost its power. The precious blood has never lost its power. I thank you that you preordained us before the foundation of the earth. You predestined us, O oh Lord, and that you adopted us into your kingdom, my Father, that we could be co-heirs with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I thank you that the same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead dwells inside of us, and I thank you we'll be able to use that power and authority for your glory and for your honor. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, take over from beginning and to the end, Holy Spirit. Nasarebo shokura masata, blaskandra seteleboroboze, mashoko non durabasete, brehala la la bondro soto, no barabasete, nishka malo rebasata, no labarebo sondo rebasete, ishka mandro scota labarere sondro. Oh, Father, be glorified now, my Father. I decrease that you increase, O oh Lord. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that the word that shall come out of my mouth shall come out like fire, that it will penetrate the hearts of your children that are here, that it shall abide in their hearts, and that they shall be able to use this word for their breakthrough and their victory. I bless your holy name now. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good morning, family of God. I greet you in the powerful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and through the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to thank the pastoral team, Pastor Anil, um, and all our pastors for giving me this awesome opportunity to stand at this holy altar to minister God's precious word. And I trust that you will be blessed this morning. Hallelujah. Today is the 1st of May, 2022. And I'm going to just spend a short time on elaborating on the significance of this day. May Day. 
the 1st of May 2022. We in South Africa celebrate this as Workers' Day or Labor Day, but internationally it is also celebrated as International Labor Day, and it is, and it is coined Le May Day. It is coined the term May Day, and it has much significance, and I want you to catch the significance because we are entering into a month, into a season, the fifth month and the fifth season. There's much significance in this, and I want you to catch the significance of this month and receive it into your life for your breakthrough. Hallelujah. Amen. So firstly, we're entering into the fifth month, and this is the first day of the fifth month, and five speaks about favor and grace. So in the Bible, there are many stories and many characters such as Ruth, David, and Noah. Now, every time in the book of Ruth, for example, the fifth time her name was mentioned in the book of Ruth had to do with her getting favor and grace. Likewise with Noah. The fifth time his name was mentioned, it was to do with him getting favor and grace, and so would David. So we're entering into the season of favor and grace. Secondly, this is International Labor Day, May Day. Now, you need to understand the history of how May Day arose and, and how we get the name May Day. And, and this started because workers protested uh, and they were protesting to have an eight-hour working day. Eight hours of work, eight hours of leisure, and eight hours of sleep. So in 1856 in Australia, there was a labor movement, protests, to fight for this right of having an eight-hour working day. And then 30 years later in Chicago, many protesters had gathered, had gathered in the Haymarket Square of Chicago on the 1st of May. And they were protesting against the government so that they could have an eight-hour working day. And then there were many protesters and the police had gathered in force. Now somebody during that protest action threw a bomb into the crowd. And until today, nobody knows who did it. But that resulted in many policemen and civilians being killed. Five anarchists were arrested on that day. Five. Because of this protest action. And during the course of their arrest, while they were arrested and kept in detention, one of those anarchists died in detention and the five others were hung. So, as a result of that, it gave impetus to the commemoration of the lives that were lost on the 1st of May. And it then escalated into the 1st of May being International Workers' Day because they were commemorating the lives of the people who lost their lives during that protest. You understand? So there's much significance about how we get to celebrate or we get to have this public holiday, Labor Day. And in 1996, we as South Africans, the government of South, uh, South Africa adopted labor laws and promulgated labor laws where now we have an eight-hour uh, uh, workers' day. So in essence, workers were rescued. Workers were rescued from gross exploitation, from what some would call slavery. And the greatest story ever told about slavery is found in the books of, the book of Exodus, where God rescued his people. And what happened here is that Pharaoh and now seeing that the Israelites were growing in strength and in number. 
And so he decided to enslave them. And he enslaved them by getting them to build two storehouses called Pitom and Ramesses. And he had placed taskmasters over them to drive them. And the taskmasters were ruthless and merciless and afflicted them much. So much so that the Israelites who were now slaves began to cry out to God for help. And God heard them. And God, through Moses, got the Israelites to come out of Egypt. Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and through the Red Sea. And then through Joshua, God took them into the promised land. God rescued the Israelites from slavery. So praise be to God. We have Workers' Day and, and we do not have exploitation of workers. May Day has also other significance in many cultures throughout the world. And this started before May Day was promulgated as an international uh, Labor Day. Other cultures in the world celebrated May Day because it ushered in spring. And so it was a harvest time. And they celebrated, and they celebrated with much joy. May Day brought togetherness, it brought unity, and it brought rebirth in many cultures. And in the Northern Hemisphere, they celebrated May Day with maypole dancing, and uh, there was a lot of festivities during this time. In the Celtic uh, the Celtics celebrated May Day. The Celtics celebrated May Day in what is called Beltani. Now, Beltani was a, a ritual that they would do, uh, where they would make two big bonfires. They would make these two big bonfires, and they would drive the cattle through these bonfires. And as their herd of cattle was going through these bonfires, they were cleansed of disease and sickness, and evil. So that was the tradition of the Celtics, uh, and, and, and this was celebrated much in Ireland and in Scotland. May Day has also got another meaning which is completely different to the, the public holiday and the day that we know celebrate as May Day. May Day is known as an, a, a distress signal, an emergency signal which is used by aviators and mariners when they are experiencing a life-threatening situation. The situation has, been, has to be life-threatening in order for them to may, uh, invoke a May Day signal. And so the requirement is, if you are in a life-threatening situation, you have to call out, May Day, May Day, May Day. And then you would get a response. And they would do this via the radio, telephone. They would call for help. And so, how, how, did, they, how did this term, May Day, come, come to be? There was a man named Frederick Stanley Mockford. And he was in charge of the radio communication at the airport in Croydon in England. And um, in the 1920s, he was tasked with formulating or coming up with a word that could be used internationally that would signal a distress. And so because at that time he was, the, 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 the majority of the air traffic was between England and France, he used a French word which is called midi. And midi means help me. And the, 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 that's the short of the word, vene midi. Vene midi means, come and help me. He shortened it to midi, which is come help. And midi means mayday. And hence, we have the distress signal, mayday. So, if you're in difficulty, know that you can call today 
Today has got such a significance. See, if I have to summarize all the words of May Day, we've got favor, we've got grace, we've got togetherness, we've got unity, we've got rebirth, we've got um, rescuing from being exploited. God rescuing. And you've got May Day, come and help. Today, has anybody got a Mayday situation? Has anybody, does anybody need God's help? Today, we can cry out for help because today is a significant day. And we're entering into a significant month. A month where you can call in and claim that which you need. You can claim your breakthrough in this month. Whatever it is. Hallelujah. So, in 1995... Um, and this was in Port Shepston. In 1995, my father was murdered in his business. And a month before my father was murdered in his business, I was running the shop. Uh, I would relieve my father on a Saturday and, and manage the shop during that day. And say, so on this particular day, it was a Saturday. I was running the shop. It was around 8 p.m. And just about cashing up, etc. And two men walked into the shop. And as they walked into the shop, I served them, and suddenly they pulled out firearms and pointed at me. And then the third guy rushes into the shop, pulls the shop door closed, and he brandishes an AK-47. He comes around the corner, comes around the counter, and he gets me to remove my jacket and shoes and lay on the floor. And at this time, he tramps my head against the floor firmly. By this time, the other two guys are around the counter and they're searching for money, obviously taking all the money from the cash register. They asked for firearms. I said, I have none. And they asked specifically for my father's briefcase. And my father was old school, so he never banked regularly, and I knew what my father had in the briefcase was the entire week's taking. So if that briefcase was stolen, my father would be financially ruined. So, but this briefcase was underneath the counter. They asked for the briefcase. I said, no, my father had taken the briefcase and my father's gone home with the briefcase. So the one guy is looking underneath the counter and he's using his hand without bending down to see, but he's using his hand to feel. And as he was feeling just before, just before the briefcase, in front of the briefcase was this spray gun. It's a gas gun. To, you, know, you spray to immobilize. It's like tear gas. He came across that, and then suddenly he got all anxious and excited. He said, this guy has got firearms, and he's lied to us. I said, I'm not lying. So the, all three of them jumped, jumped on me, and they were trampling me. And they said, he, you're lying. You've got a firearm. He, this is the firearm. I said, that is... A water gun. I took a huge chance, but I said, that is a water gun. So when the guy squeezed the trigger, some gas was emitted. And I said, see, that's, that's water coming out. And fortunately, he believed me that it was a water gun. So then the two guys got everything that they wanted, all the cash from the cash register. And this is happening in, in seconds. This is, it's, it's happening so fast. They then retreated out of the shop. But before they retreated out of the shop, they told the third guy who was holding me hostage there on the ground, no witnesses. I knew at that time I was going to be killed. And I, I'm looking into the eye of this guy that was, who had this firearm on my head, on my temple, on my temple. I knew if he, if he squeezed that trigger with an AK-47, there was no chance at all of me surviving. I, I looked and I could see death in his eye. And his, his hand was literally trembling on the trigger. I knew I was going to be killed. And, and, and I, I had no time to exercise my faith like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I had, I had no time to rebuke Satan. I had no time to bind death. I couldn't even utter a word. There was no time to even utter a word. But that, at that precise 
point in time when the guy was about to pull the trigger, I saw a picture flash in my mind. I saw a picture. It was a picture frame. And I'm going to show you this picture frame. And I'll ask the media team to just put it up if they can so you can see what I'm talking about. This is the fit picture frame that I'm talking about. I saw this picture of Jesus, who is the shepherd, carrying a sheep in his hand and a star, rod and a staff in the other hand. I saw this picture flash through my mind. And immediately, when this picture flashed through my mind, I called for help. In my mind, I didn't utter the words. In my mind, I said, help me, Jesus. In my mind. And when I said this, something happened with, with this guy who had an AK-47 on my head. It's almost as if his finger froze on the trigger. And he had a bewildered look on his face as if he was confused. Now, just, just aside before I continue with the story is, at that time, I was not a believer. I was not a believer. And I, I was the youngest of four sons. And I was at home at the time. I hadn't spread my wings. Uh, so I was following whatever religion my mother was following. And my mother was Hindu at the time. So in my mother's prayer room, she had pictures of various gods, including some idols. And amongst those pictures that my mother had in a prayer room was this. This is the actual picture that my mother had in her prayer room. I was fortunate this week and I was going through some of my mother's golden oldies, looking if I, if I was lucky enough that I would find this frame. And indeed, I found this frame. So it, it gives authentication to what I'm saying. The picture on this frame is what flashed through my mind. And little did I realize when I called out for help, little did I realize that when I was in my mother's prayer room, uh, praying to all the gods, I also lifted up my hands like this to the picture on this frame and asking, Jesus, bless me. I did that. I did not know Jesus. All I knew of Jesus was my brother Anil was saved and was going to church. And sometimes he would take me to uh, Sunday school in his particular church up there on, on the hill. And I knew Jesus, but I did not have a relationship with Jesus. But you see, Jesus does not have a timeline. So even though I was unsaved here, but I honored him. And I said, bless me, Jesus. Jesus saw and knew when I gave my heart to him in his timeline, because there is no timeline. So Jesus rescued me. And little did I realize by, by lifting up my hands like this and honoring Jesus as the shepherd. Because that's a picture of Jesus being the shepherd. Yeah. I was actually invoking a blessing upon my life. And what blessing did I invoke? I invoked the blessing of Psalm 23 over my life. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down beside green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for the Lord is with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You set before me a table in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, for I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I invoked this blessing in my life. Hallelujah. And what made 
this servant of Satan retreat because he became bewildered and suddenly he, 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 he started stepping back. Something, something got to him. I did, not, I did not know the answer to this question until I was preparing this message. And I got spiritual enlightenment and then I realized what made him disperse. He saw the light in me. He saw the light in me. And light dispels darkness. Light dispels darkness and hence he retreated and he dispersed himself. Hallelujah. And so I understood, I understood whilst preparing this message that light dispels darkness. Light dispels darkness. So, let us get, and this is how I get to my topic. I am the light of this world. And it's, this topic has, it is, it has a double punch to it. And it's a two-edged sword. And I will, I will explain to you how it is a two-edged sword. I am the light. So let's, let's go right to the beginning. Genesis 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. And he saw that the earth was formless, was void, and darkness covered the deep. And the Spirit of the Lord was hovering over the water. Darkness is used for the first time. Here in Genesis 1, we see it on like the second or third line of the Bible. Darkness, the word darkness. Now, I just need to ask the question, when, when was Lucifer or Satan kicked out or cast out of heaven? There, the Bible doesn't record any specific time. So we don't know specifically at what point in time Lucifer was cast out of heaven. But we see the word darkness here in the second line, in the first verse of Genesis. And we know darkness is synonymous with Satan. When we talk about darkness, from a spiritual perspective, we link it to Satan. So, and, and we know the story of Adam and Eve, which is uh, in, in chapter 3. We get Adam and Eve's story. And we know that sin enters into Adam and Eve. So, Lucifer had to be cast out before Adam and Eve. Somewhere in between. And I put it to Lucifer being cast out in between Genesis 1 and 2. That's when darkness came and covered the earth. So scientists define darkness as an absence of a thing. It's an absence of light. You see, light, light can be quanti is quantifiable. Light is measured in lumens. Light is quantifiable, but darkness not. Darkness cannot be quantified. And so, darkness is a void. It is an emptiness, and darkness is, is formless. Is formless. And when Adam and Eve sinned, darkness took on a, an additional meaning. It took on an additional meaning in the form of sin. So when we sin, darkness comes into our lives. Darkness fills in this temple. We are the temple of the living God. Darkness comes and fills in this temple when we sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, they invited sin into humankind. And hence, darkness came into the world. So there's an additional meaning now. Besides it being evil, Sin also brings about darkness. And the devil is crafty. 
what the devil does is that the devil puts a veil over your understanding. He puts a veil over your understanding so that your eyes of your heart, the eyes of your heart cannot see. And so the devil, Satan, causes a spiritual darkness in your life. And so there's two forms of spiritual darkness, the one being spiritual blindness. And what is spiritual blindness? Spiritual blindness is where you can see properly. There's no problem with that. But you cannot see the things of God. You cannot see what God has got in store for you. You cannot see, you cannot, and you don't even know God and have a relationship with Him. That is spiritual darkness. And, 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 and one of the stories in the Bible that, that best describes this is found in Genesis 21, 19. It's the story of Hagar. So you know the story, Hagar had uh, Abraham's son because at that point in time, Sarah could not conceive and she allowed Abraham to, to, to have a child with Hagar. But once the child was conceived and, and Sarah had her boy, Isaac, then at, at a particular celebration, Sarah saw Ishmael mocking Isaac. And then she told Abraham that Hagar and Ishmael must leave, for they should not be part of his inheritance. And Abraham was besotted about, he, was, he, was, he didn't like to do this didn't want to do this, but he had no choice because then God confirmed that he must do this, and Abraham was obedient to God. So Abraham gave her some food and a skin of water, and as she was going through the wilderness, the water ran out, and when the water ran out, thirst set in, so much so that they were at the point of death. There was no water, and so Hagar put Ishmael under some shrubs, and she went a distance away from him. She did not want for him to see her dying. Neither did she want to see him dying. So she sat a distance away from him. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Hagar and said, Why are you ailing? And then the angel in 2119, Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave him a drink. You see, Hagar was spiritually blind. The water was right in front of her. The well was right in front of her. Yeah. And it's only when God opened her eyes that she saw the well. So spiritual blindness makes you, you can't see things that are right in front of you. Spiritual blindness also causes fear in you. In 2 Kings, we see the story of Elisha's servant. Right? 15 to 17. 2 Kings 6, 15 to 17. We see Elisha's servant. What he, when he opened up his eyes, he saw there was a great army surrounding the city. And he became afraid. And this great army not only outnumbered them, they outpowered them and they, were, they had a lot of weapons. They, the servant of, of Elisha knew that they would be defeated. So he was afraid and asked Elisha, what shall we do? And then Elisha prayed to God and prayed to God that God opens his eyes so that he could see God's invisible army. Because God's invisible army was surrounding all the Syrians. Yeah. And God's invisible armies were, were with horses and chariots of fire. And, and the story goes on that the, the, uh, God's army defeated this, the army of this, the Syrians. But you see, Elisha had to pray that God opens his eyes so that he could see God's army. You see, we have angels encamped around us. We have guardian angels. We can't see them. 
we, we don't even believe that they are there. Once we believe that we are there, they are there. And they will come to your rescue. They will come to your rescue. You ask for help, and they will come to your rescue. So spiritual blindnesses, blindness causes fear, anxiety in you, and worry. But if you have the scales of your eyes removed, then you get the peace of God flooding your heart, and then you have shalom peace in a dark situation. You can have shalom peace in a dark situation once the scales of your eyes are removed. The second form of spiritual darkness is a pit of darkness. The pit of darkness. And in Genesis 37 verse 20, we see the story of Joseph. Joseph thrown into the pit by his brothers. Now, why did they throw him into the pit? They said, let us catch him and throw him into one of the pits. So, they will believe that a ferocious animal devoured him. And then, we will see what happened to his dreams. You see, they were afraid of Joseph's dreams. Because Joseph dreamed that they will be bowing to him. They were jealous of that. So they were afraid of Joseph's dream. So that's why it says, the Bible says, then we will see what becomes of his dreams. So they threw him in the pit, not because of they were after Joseph, but they were after Joseph. They wanted to kill Joseph's dreams and the plan and purpose for which God had for him in yeah. his life. Yeah. They wanted to kill that. So too, we... There's a plan and a purpose for us. And the devil is not after us. But the devil is after that vision, that dream. The devil is after that purpose for you. God created you to be blessed. God already knows your end and your end is one of blessing. God can't have created you to be suffering. He's not that God. He created you to be blessed so your ending should be a blessing. You should be, have a blessed life. But all through this journey, the enemy comes and kills those dreams. Kills those dreams because he doesn't want you to reach your end, which is the blessed end that God has purpose for you. You understand that the enemy comes to rob you of your dreams. So, darkness in the pit causes affliction darkness in the pit causes pain and it and it causes the greatest challenges in your life many of us are in that situation where we are we feel that we are in the pit in this deep dark hole we feel we are in that position and we can't get out but i can tell you that you may be, you walked in backwards into the pit. They threw you into the pit. The devil thought that you were moving backwards. But as you're moving backwards, you sit on the throne. You sit on the throne. You are backed up. You are backed up. You see what happened to Joseph? He became the ruler. In the, he became a ruler. He became the Pharaoh's chief governor. All the way, Joseph suffered from the pit. He went into Potiphar's house. He suffered. He was backing up. He was backing up. The devil thought they was destroying him. The yeah. devil thought that they were destroying him. He's backing up. The devil put him into prison, yeah. into a dark prison. They backing him up. They back him up. They, he's backing up. And then suddenly, he is sitting. He's sitting on the ruler's chair. He's sitting on the governor's chair. You may be backing up into things. You may be walking backwards. But God has got something in store for you. There is light at the end of your tunnel. We are experiencing darkness like never before. In the world, due to COVID, there's six, almost 6.3 million people dead. Unprecedented. 6.3 million people? That's like a, a whole country's population. In, in South Africa, we've, we've lost over 100,000 people 
due to COVID. During the riots, we lost 342 people. During the floods, we lost 435 people. Calamities that we have never seen before. Darkness is trying to invade the world. Physically, darkness is trying to invade the world. We're experience, even experiencing it physically, like load shedding. We're experiencing forced darkness upon our lives. And of course, spiritually, there's a deep darkness. But let me not exalt darkness, because I can tell you, there is light at the end of the tunnel. There's light at the end of the tunnel. And so, let's move to the picture of light. Let's go back to Genesis, but let's look at verses 3 and 4. So we dealt with Genesis 1 and 2. We saw the darkness, we saw the void, the formlessness, the emptiness, darkness covering the deep waters. Now in verse 3, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And verse 4, God said, when God saw the light, he said the light was good. And then God divided the light from the darkness. Right there we see the battle between good and evil. Right there, Genesis 4, separate, God separated light from darkness. The battle between good and evil began. Yeah. It began right there. So, light, light brings transparency. Light, light is honesty. You need to understand that light... Light, nothing can be hidden from light. Nothing can be hidden from light. And in the beginning, in, in, in Psalm 119, verse 105, I'm talking now, I'm taking you to Old Testament. You need to understand the chronology of events. Right there in the Old Testament, Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So in the Old Testament, the Word was the light. The Word was the light. So all the spiritual leaders, they wanted light, they wanted spiritual enlightenment, they would go and study and read the Word of God. Because the Word of God was the light. But then, but then, things changed. In John 1, 4, verse 4, In him there is life, and the life is the light of men. Jesus is the life, and Jesus' life is the light of men. So things changed around. Things switched from the Word being the light in the Old Testament in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light. Now, I, I need you to also understand this sin. Sin causes darkness into your life, brings darkness into your life, and more especially, unconfessed sin. Unconfessed sin just invades, invades your temple. And, and, and to demonstrate this, I'll, I'll tell you a story about, uh, firstly, Adam and Eve. When Adam was in the garden, God and ate of the, the fruit of the tree. God came and asked him, did you eat of the tree? And Adam, he didn't say yes or no. He said, uh, but the woman. So he blamed his wife. He blamed his wife in the garden of Eden. And, and just to paraphrase what happened to Adam, God said, get out of paradise. Unconfessed sin. He did not take accountability and blame for his actions. Instead, he chose to blame his wife. Yeah. Whereas, whereas, let's look at another story. In the book of Luke, Luke 6, verses 41 to 43. This is the story of the thief. 
This is the story of the, the, the thief who was hanging on the, was crucified on the right hand side of Jesus. So there were two criminals, one on the left hand side and one on the right hand side. Now, at that time when Jesus, Jesus was already crucified and hanging on the cross and the soldiers had ripped out his, tore his clothes and were sharing his garments. And Jesus said, forgive them. Forgive them for they know not what they do. And the, 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 the criminal on the right hand side who was also hung on, that, on the cross, he heard what Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he was convicted. He was convicted right there and then. Imagine this man who's, who's hanging on the cross, who's, his body is shredded. And he's saying, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was convicted. So when his, the other criminal was hanging on the left-hand side, he condemned Jesus. He said, but if you are God, save yourself and save us. And he condemned God. And then this, this criminal on the right hand says, but why do you condemn him? You don't know him. And you know what? The Bible says that he called Jesus God. How did he know Jesus was God? He was a criminal hanging on the cross. How did he, did he know? Because he, he, he said, that's God hanging on the cross. And this criminal, this criminal says, this man has done nothing. But you see, we, we, I'm paraphrasing, we, we hang on this cross, we deserve to be hanging on this cross. It's justified for us being crucified because we have committed a crime. So what is this criminal, in essence, doing? He is taking accountability and he's taking all the blame for his actions. And Jesus says, really? Are you really taking all the blame for your action? This criminal said, Lord, when you're going to your kingdom, take me with you. And Jesus says, assuredly, today you will be with me in paradise. So if you look at the contrast here, Adam kicked out of paradise because he didn't confess his sin. He didn't take accountability. Whereas this criminal, this criminal, who was far worse than Adam, Adam ate a fruit. Come on. This guy committed crimes and he was hanging on the cross. He took the blame, confessed his sin, and he was, he entered paradise on the same day. I say, don't let sin fester in your life. Think of it as a thorn in your foot. You know when you get your stone, a thorn in your foot, it is the most nagging pain that you can experience. And it stops you in your tracks dead. You, wherever you are, you'll, you'll sit, find a place, and you'll take out that shoe or sock, and you'll pull that minute, that, that small, tingy, minute thing. You'll, you'll get a tweezer to pull that thing out. Because it's a nagging pain. Sin is like that. When you think of it, when you, if you sin, think of it like that thorn. Pull it out immediately. Just confess your sin. Repent. And God is just to forgive you. God is merciful to forgive you. So let's get back to, to, to the light. In in John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Remember, remember we, we had Psalm 119, uh, 119 verse 105. The word was the light unto my feet. And then in John 4, 1, 4, Jesus said, I am the life and in his life is the light of men. Then we get John 8, 8, 12. says, I am the light of this, world, of this world. Whoever believes in me shall not walk in darkness. Shall not walk in darkness. Right? But have the life of light. Light. Light of life. That's the word in John 8, 12. Now, when did he say this? I need you to understand the setting that he said these words because it's very important of when he said these words. So, it was... At that time, John 7 and 8 talks about the, the Israelites, the Jews celebrating 
the Feast of Tabernacles. They were celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles and it was an eight days feast. They would celebrate for eight days straight. And during that time there was much joy and rejoicing because they were remembering the time God brought them out from the wilderness. How God saved them. How God rescued them in the wilderness. God provided for them. God protected them in the wilderness. So they were celebrating with much jubilation. And in that time of the celebration, they would build these temporary structures. Temporary wooden structures. And uh, the celebration within the Feast of Tabernacles was called Sukkot. They would live in that wooden temporary structures for eight days. And they would eat in there for eight days because they were remembering the time the Israelites were living in temporary structures in the wilderness. So that's how they were commemorating and, and celebrating this time. So this is the time, the Feast of the Tabernacles, that Jesus said these words, I am the light of this world. But before that, in John 7, 737, Jesus says that whoever thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Forever, whoever believes in me, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. That's said in John 737, which is before 8, right? Now the setting there is the same feast of the tabernacles. And, and, and what happened when, before Jesus could say that I am the, the living water? is that every morning the priests would go and they would carry a golden cask, a flask. They would go to the pool of Shiloch. Right? The pool of Shiloch was at the bottom of Mount Moriah and it was the original source of water for Jerusalem. And this pool fell directly in the shadow of the holy temple. So the priests would go and the whole congregation would follow the priests as he was going to do something very significant. He would go, the priest would go to this pool, fill the flask up with pure water, pure water from this pool. And he would come back and return back with this flask to the temple. And as he was coming up, up with this flask to the temple, they would be singing and rejoicing, and the shofar would blow. They would blow the shofar. Imagine, the, 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 can you visualize what, what I'm talking about here? And the city was full with people. All the Jews were celebrating. The shofar would be blowing because they're bringing this water in this golden flask to the temple. What? And then this priest, in the ceremony, he would take the water from this golden flask and he would pour it onto the altar, which was in the middle of the temple. The, they were remembering and celebrating the time when they were at their darkest point in the wilderness, they had no water. And God told Moses, take your rod and strike it on the rock. And out of the rock came water. And they had water to drink. So it was a celebration of God providing them water in their darkest situations. God provides. So they were celebrating this act. Now Jesus, Jesus is there at the celebration. Is in the temple. And as when they finish pour the water onto this altar, Jesus proclaims in John 7 37. If anyone thirsts, now he's talking to a sea of people because they're all watching the ceremonial act. He would thirst, come to me and drink. For if you believe in me, out of your heart shall flow rivers of of living water. He's making this proclamation in front of all these people. In, in essence, he is saying that I am the Messiah. I am. He's proclaiming himself to be the Messiah in that very moment. He's the living waters. So, now you got, he made this declaration. That was on the eighth day of the feast. Actually, the last day of the feast, he made this declaration in the temple. And then you move on to John 8, verse 12, where he says, 
I am the light of this world. Now you, you, you need to once again understand the setting of this. When and how and why did he say these words? The setting of these words and the significance of the setting. You see, during the feast, the priests would have four candelabras. And in the middle of the temple, which is in the woman's court, the, the priests would place these candelabras. And in evening time, the priests would light the candles on the can candelabras. And the theologians say that these candles were so bright that anyone in Jerusalem could see the light of these candelabras. It shone, it illuminated Jerusalem. Now, in that before Jesus could utter these words, it was like dawn, the ninth day, dawn. But the people are still there because it's towards the end of the festivities. As the candles went out, Jesus stands there and he says, I am the light of this world. So what he's saying, what he's saying, you see, why, what were they celebrating by lighting these candles? They were remembering how God brought them to the world, through the wilderness. God directed them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So fire then in the Old Testament represented the light. Fire is what gave them light. So God provided for them light in the wilderness. But Jesus now is saying, see, I am the God that directed you with a pillar of fire by night. I am the Messiah that did that for you. And you see this candle, this candle lights that's gone off? I'm better than that. I'm better than that. I am the light of this world. I am the light of this world. So, also, I need you to understand the chronology. Now we're moving on. Jesus is saying, I am the light of this world. Then, in, in John uh, 4.1, it says that I am the life, and in, my li in the life is the light of the world. So he's declaring that he is the light of this world. Then something happens, and it's the dynamics change. He changes the dynamics of things. And he says in Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16, and let me read that for you. You are the light of the world. Remember, I said, he, look at the chronology, he is the light of the world. Now he's saying, you are the light of the world. A city that is a set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they lamp, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives it light to all those who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You are the light of this world. The dynamics have changed. He says you are a city on the hill. So the author of, the author of this book, John, he, when he wrote this, he, he's, he's, he's seeing the city on the hill, and this was the city of Safed. It was across the temple. It was a high city sitting some 2,650 meters above sea level. Now, this city at night, when it was illuminated, you, can, you can't miss it. It says, the Bible is saying here, you are that city on that hill that when you walk, when people see you, they can't miss you. You should be there because you are the light. You should be like the city on this hill that no that people must see you. This is not about being, we are not undercover Christians or secret agent Christians. We're not. We are the light of this world. Neither should you be a light that's put under a basket and covered up. We should not be Christians that cover up things. We should be Christians that exposes darkness, not cover up things. So the basket covers 
things, but you should be on a lampstand. And you should do good works. You should do good works. Righteousness. It's, it's your, how you carry yourself in doing good works that make you shine like the light. So, you are now the light of this world. So, in John 4, 1, Jesus was the life, and in his life was the light of men. Then in, 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 John, in John 9, 5, he says, the Bible says, as long as I am in the world, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light. Make it clear. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light. So Jesus was in the world for 33 years, and he was the light of the world. Because what he did, you see, in the Old Testament, Jesus, the word was the light. And then Jesus took on the flesh, took the word became flesh. The word became flesh. And that's how Jesus became the light of this world. And then he's saying here, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light. And then in Matthew 5, 12, it says, now you are the light. Because before that, in John 17, it says that my work is finished and Father, I return to you. So he's gone and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. After he made this proclamation in John 4, 1. He goes and sits at the right hand of his Father and he says, you are now the light of this world. So we have a huge responsibility. I, I, I don't know if you fathom what a responsibility we have. Because we are the light of the world. And Jesus created us in his image. You see the, the word light is I'm the light of the world. The meaning of light in Greek is force. And force is where we derive, it's P-H-O-S, force. And it is where we derive our English word photograph. We should be a photograph of Jesus, the same image of him. Jesus wants us to live our lives being a photo image of Jesus. And that is why um, he says, now you are the light of this world. So we have a huge responsibility. And you see, if you, if you look at a camera, if you take a camera, and, and you remember back in the day, uh, for those who are old enough, cameras had film, films. And uh, once you've taken out all your photographs, you would take it for the films to be developed. But when the films were being developed, uh, they would do so in a dark room. And lo and behold, if you open the door and allow light to enter into the room, what would happen? The photographs would be ruined, to be destroyed. So we who have darkness in our lives, open the door, allow the light to come in, and the light destroys the darkness. Hallelujah. So when, 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 when Jesus says, we are the light of the world, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge responsibility. But then Jesus sends us a helper. Because we can't do it on our, own, on our own. We can't be the light of this world on our own. We need the light within us to radiate. So Jesus sends us the, a helper, and the helper is the Holy Spirit. So on the day of Pentecost, Jesus sent, the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came like a flaming fire on the 120 that were there in the upper room. The Holy Spirit then indwelled them. And then these people were filled with the Spirit, and they had the light within them. So likewise, we as believers who are baptized in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to abide in us and indwell in us. 
and it is the Holy Spirit that radiates the light from within us. So when somebody, you know, it's I think the greatest compliment that somebody can pay to you when they say, hey, you know what? You are glowing today. Yeah. Absolutely glowing today. In essence, what, what are they meaning? What, or what, what, what can they see? Because obviously there's a light radiating from you. You are glowing due to a light emitting from your humanity. And it is the Holy Spirit radiating this light from you. That is what the people can see and see the glow about you. We should be walking in that glow that it will draw people unto you. It will draw people unto you that even when people touch your, the hem of your garment, they must be healed. You see, Jesus left us with a helper. And Jesus says, go, go into the world and make disciples. He's given us the power and authority to heal the sick, to cast out demons, and to do miracles in his name. We have the power and authority that is within us. You see, when Jesus went above, the same power and authority that took Jesus above, that same power and authority comes and resides within us. We have that same power and authority within us. So we are given an awesome mandate to be the light of this world. And if you have to look for the golden thread throughout my message, you will see it started off with there being a rescuing. There being a rescue, people being rescued from exploitation. We know the story, the greatest story ever told of God taking the Israelites out of Egypt. He rescued them. I myself have my personal, own personal story of being rescued. You see Hagar being rescued. You see Elisha and his servants being rescued by the invisible army. You see Joseph being rescued in the pit. It is our mandate now that we have, we, we know who we are. Because this word says clearly, there can be no ambiguity about it, that we are the light of this world. Is to know the authority we have, is to know what we are carrying within us to be the light in this world. And primarily, in essence, John, John Scott said in his book, in The Authentic Jesus, Christianity is a rescue religion. That's what he said. In the book, in the, in the first book of the Bible, John, uh, Genesis 1, verse f 1 to 4, you see the whole message of salvation. Because the earth was void. It had no form. It was empty. And darkness covered, covered it. And God said, let there be light. Likewise, likewise with us, we are void. We are are empty. We are formless until the light of God comes into us and brings about salvation. We, as the light of the world, world should be rescuers of people to bring people to the salvation of God. That's our function. That's why God created us and put us, put the light within us. So where we walk, yeah. we help others. We help bring them to salvation. And it's all about you just walking in good deeds. You just walking in good deeds. If you walk in good deeds and in righteousness, people are attracted to that. And they come and they come. And they see you as a true Christian. We should be true Christians. And help people to bring them into salvation. In Matthew 9, verse 5, we, we know the, the story of the, where Jesus takes Peter, John, and James to high up on the mountain, and now known as the Mount of Transfiguration. What happened to Jesus there? It's like Jesus was transfigured and the sun shone out of him, that even his clothes were bright as light. Jesus was transfigured. The word transfigured means, in Greek, means metamorpho. 
And that's where we get our English word metamorphosis. It's like how a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly. Metamorphosis. See, what happened to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration is that the deity within him shone. Shone out of his humanity. So the supernatural within him shone out of his humanity. The light within him shone out of his humanity. And likewise, we as believers, we need to experience a metamorphosis in our lives. We need that light to radiate out of us. We need the light to shine because we are the light of this world. So I pray that God shines the light in every area of your life and that light dispels every darkness. You'll be filled with light and that the Holy Spirit within you ignites, ignites like a fire and dispels that darkness. But first, you've got to confess your sin and repent. And when you do so, that forgiveness comes and that the Holy Spirit can start operating in your life. We bless God, we bless God for His Word, and we thank Him. We give Him praise, glory, and honor. Hallelujah. We're going to stand and uh, prepare for communion. But before I do that, beloved, this light of Jesus Christ, I want it to radiate in your life that you will be the light shiners upon the earth. With every head bowed and eyes closed right now, there may be some of you this day that much darkness could have come in into certain areas of your life that is robbing you. Some of you have never declared Jesus Christ as Lord. But I want to say to you today, this Jesus is truly Lord and King and Savior. He is the resurrection and the life. The Bible says, He that believes in Him, though they were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in Him shall never die, but shall have eternal life. And I want to say to you today, as we come to this table, it's a reflection of everything Jesus has done. It's a reflection of the price he paid for you. And I say today, you don't have to be in darkness when the light is available. And the light is available not only to make you shine upon the earth, but for eternally, that light will never be put out. So I say to you today, some of you may be grown cold, or you've never declared Jesus Christ as Lord. And those of you who are listening, I want to say to you today, come to him while you can. Jesus said, come unto me. All ye that labor and heavily laden, I shall give you rest. Call upon him in the time of trouble and he will answer. This Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I want you to know no man cometh unto the Father except by him. If there's anyone today, even those listening to me, it is an opportunity, beloved, like never before this day. Never let the darkness hold you in the, in the pit this day. Never let it, let it hold you bound. And many a times as darkness has, has led, led people away from the truth of this light, who is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Savior of the world. Is there anyone who wants to dedicate their heart to Jesus? Now is the time to say, Lord, I dedicate my life. Open this door that you heard the word. Open this door that the light can come in, that darkness can flee. Open this door for eternal life. And I'll tell you what, it'll be forever, forever this day that you, like the thief in the end, you, it, you will be in paradise when the time you are called home. This day, is there anyone to say, Lord, I give my heart to Jesus? If it's you, won't you raise your hand and put it down? Those of you watching, Thank you. Is there anyone else? Those who are watching, thank you. Those of you joining us on media, I say to you, my beloved. I say to you, my beloved, there's only two. The light and darkness. There's only two things. And the light is Jesus. The light he declared to you to be. The light of the world. And I say to you, does anyone else to say, Lord, I want to declare Jesus Christ as Lord. Then raise your hand and say, I surrender. I surrender my life to Jesus. 
Just one more moment before we take communion. Because I want you to come to the table. For those of you at home, I want you to join us with communion. While we prepare, take some juice. I bless it in the name of Jesus Christ. And take some bread, which I release, release blessing. And I say, come and eat and, and remember this G. And trust God for your miracle and breakthrough. Even before we take communion. Beloved, I say to you, how many of you right now need a miracle? How many of you right now, darkness has come to see certain areas of your life, whether it's your finance, your life, anything, I say to you today, you will get, I'm calling in the light to cast out every darkness, everything that is hidden, that is stealing from you, that is robbing from you. I say today, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that thing must be driven out. It shall be driven out. It shall be driven out in the name of Jesus. If you need that prayer, just raise your hand and say, I want, I want, I want the light to come into my life. Raise your hand quickly. If you say, Lord, I need this touch. I need this touch of the light to come upon my life in Jesus' mighty name. And so today, my God, I acknowledge you, the light of the world. This day, I call in the light of Jesus. I call in the power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth over every situation, over every individual. And Lord, whatever it is, let the light of God so shine. Drive out, Lord. Drive out every darkness. Drive out every Every scheme and wickedness, we rebuke it in the name of Jesus. My God, you touch them. My God, you intervene. You are all powerful and you are almighty. You came to set the captives free. Therefore, every chain that is holding them down be broken. Every chain of every chain of poverty, every chain of sickness, every chain of wickedness, every chain of abuse, every chain be broken now. Be broken now. Every stronghold be broken now. Father we drive out in the name of Jesus. We, we drive out every darkness. Every darkness. Every wickedness be lifted up now and be gone now in the name of Jesus. And we release your blessing. We release the blessing. We release your blessing in Jesus' mighty name. We say thank you for your touch. We say thank you for your touch. Now somebody say thank you for my miracle. I receive it in Jesus' name. Come on, you can do better. I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. And so I invite you today to join us as we take of this communion. Uh, this is real. Jesus has died on the cross. But he died that we might live and have eternal life. And we remember him today. On the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he blessed it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. And then after the same manner, after he ate, took the cup and he said this is the cup of the new testament in my blood as often as you drink of it you also do it in remembrance of me and so i bless i bless this grape juice and i bless this bread and today we remember you and father we remember what was done on calvary we discern correctly what was done on calvary we discern that you died for our sins. We discern by your stripes we are healed. We discern that eventually you took away the keys of hell and death. We discern you triumph over death and hell and make an open show against him. We discern you have given us the authority. We discern you called us then to be the light even in this world. We discern then, my God, that you made us righteous. We discern then, Lord, that the veil is torn in two, that we are able to come into the holy of holies by the blood of the Lamb. We discern that you have given us the authority 
authority then to trample upon serpents and scorpions. We discern that the Abrahamic covenant became our covenant in the mighty name of Jesus. We discern the new covenant that we do not live according to the old, but we live according to that which is bought by grace. My God, we follow and we give you praise. We discern you are King of kings, the Lord of lords this day. We discern your blood was shed for us. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Somebody take, drink in discernment of him now and eat in discernment of what he has done for you. Come let us pass it out. Hallelujah. blood has never lost its power. Beloved, I just read just a reminder in these dark days that we're facing. I want you to know at all times, never ever stop to call upon the blood of Jesus over your life and over everything you have. Because where the blood is, your pres- His presence is there. Call upon the blood. When I travel, I call upon the blood. When I go to get to sleep in that room, I, I release the blood. I even touch the bed and I sanctify it. I declare that nothing, no curse can touch you. Where the blood is, that there's divine protection and blessing. 
And so now as you drink the cup by the stripes, he, remember you are healed and receive your blessing. Receive the full measure of the finished work of Calvary in Jesus' name. Drink right now. Hallelujah. I'm going to release a blessing on you guys. Uh, just a reminder. Oh, we've got, okay. Um, I'll do the, uh, I just sit for a moment, sorry. Uh, I want to just finish the announcements. And to those on the website, God bless you. We love and appreciate you. Trust you get connected with us again on Tuesday night. And then we will see you on Sunday. God bless you. Amen.